So, at long last, the battle has ended, and thus the long-awaited minority achiever is here on your screens. My name is Abdul Jalil Labiali, son of Musa Kumo, and we are kicking the show started with a very, very important personality. This is why we call it my Northern Achiever. I'm going for a very quick commercial break, and when I come back, I'll introduce my guests, and we start the program. Don't go away. We'll be back shortly. Thank you very much for staying with us on my Northern Achiever and welcome back from the commercial break. Today, I have in my midst a great personality, a politician, now a farmer, and someone who has, who has been through a lot of things that you may not know about and today you would get to know about it all. Today, I am in, at the residence of Alhaji, lawyer, Honorable Mohamed Mumuni, former Foreign Affairs Minister, former employment minister and former ECOWAS representative to the Caribbean Pacific Group. Welcome, sir, to the program. Thank you very much. I'm so grateful to have you on our show because it's, it's been a back and forth and thankfully today we have you. And um, before we even start the program, I would love to ask, there's this long age-old, uh, you know, argument about Savurugu and Kumbungu, <laughs> which particular you know, Tao is bigger than the other, and which is more developed. What is your take on this? Well, it's interesting. I'm, I'm humbled and uh, deeply honored that my attempts uh, to live my little life in my little corner has come to the attention, and I'm being regarded as a northern great. Now, this Kumungu Savulgu thing, the banter, between the people of Kumbungu and Savurugu. It's an age old thing, it's a historical thing. A lot of people don't know how it began, but it really began in the reign of uh, Nan Dani II. There was a civil war. It started between the people of Kumbungu and Zangbalong next door over a lady who was captured by the, the Zangbalong people and was uh, to be sold into slavery. And then the Kumbuna at that time, Kumbuna Ablai, uh, sent his emissaries to go and plead that that lady was the wife of his Akarma. Okay. And that therefore they should release her, her. They refused to do so. And that led to a dispute and a war between the people of Kumbungu and Zangbalang. The Zangbalang, of course, the Kumbungu people took a very short time to uh, annihilate the <laughs> Zangbalang people. But the chief of Zangbalang, was a Yanabia, that's the son of a Yana. Yes. So he actually ran to Savurgu, which was also occupied by the son of a Yana. Yes. Then the Kumunablai marched on Savurgu and then destroyed Savurgu, actually, uh, you know, uh, con conquered them as it were. Okay. The Yana asked the Karna Alasane to engage Kumunabla in battle and he refused to do so because he was maternally related to Kumbungu. So the Yana himself, Nandani, had to mobilize and then he made war on the people of Kumbungu by going to Savulugu to oust Kumunabla. Kumunabla was actually killed in that battle and then, you know, Kumbungu was uh, attacked and completely bent down. A lot of Kumungu people went into exile. That's why today, in many parts of Ghana, you see a lot of Dagbamba who went out early were people from Kumbungu. It's as a result of that civil war. But after the conquest of, uh, of, of Kumbungu by Nandani, there was a peace conference, true, true stuff. some kind of uh, yeah, reconciliation, which was very successful. And then at the, at the end of it, they reconciled the people of Kumbungu and Savulugu and told them that there was no more war, but that nobody should even talk about that incident again. They should rather engage themselves and, you know, into banter, into play, into joking. And that is how the whole thing began. Wow. A lot of people don't know this history, but that's what it is, really. This is just intriguing, unbelievable. It has just started. 
and already i have learned a lot if you haven't i have so stick and stay more is to come now we have let we have heard a lot about you we know who you are because you indeed are a great man. but who are you the story is usually said better by the horses themselves indeed thank you very much again as, as i say i'm deeply humbled by the accolades that you are Showering you, on you me. So much you, really. you so much deserve uh, it. You so much deserve it. My name is Alhaji Muhammad Mumuni. Uh, a lot of people know me as Lawyer Mumuni, yeah, sure. which is my vocation. Uh, I was born in Kumbungu to a peasant farmer and a Wanzam. He was called Mumun Wanzam. Right. And my mother was uh, Haji Ashatupole. You know, she was a petty trader. She traded in share butter. Okay. Uh, I was born, I believe, in 1949, 28th July 1949. It's my official yeah, date yeah. of birth. But it's actually guesswork. Yeah. It's not real. Yeah. Because at the time some of us were born, they had not introduced the birth and death uh, register. And we're, we belong to the first generation of educated people. And therefore, in my family, I'm the very first to ever go to school. There was nobody to record my date of birth. But I asked my mother, when was I born? I said, ah, you, you were born in the Kanchaklanchu Uni. <laughs> Kanchaklanchu, I said, what is Kanchaklanchu? He said, look, Kanchaklanchu is the year when the America sent some f f food aid to Ghana, okay. some big grains of maize. Okay. Okay. They called it Kanchaklanchu. You know, so when she said that, and she said it was towards the end of that year I was born. So I, later in life, I did some researches at the Ministry of Agri, and I found out that 1948 was a famine year. Okay. There was a lot of famine in 1948, and that that was actually the year that the American aid came. So I said, okay, if it was towards the end of 48, then, because, so I chose 1949. Okay. Then I chose July. You know, I initially chose 14th July. Okay. But incidentally, when I applied for my first passport, <laughs> and I filled the, 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 the date 14th July, okay. when the passport came, on the passport was 28th July. Wow. So I said, well, maybe God wanted to change, okay. to correct me. So I adopted that date. Okay. So, right, we, we know your mom, we know your dad, and we know where you come from. Um, but which schools did you attend, you know, from primary to... Yeah. I attended the Kumbungu Local Authority Primary School from 1955. Uh, in 1960, they changed the academic year. It was January to December. In 1960, they changed it from September. You know, and when I left primary six, in those days, there was only one middle school in the whole of the Eastern Dagbang. That was Kalpohem uh, Middle School. It was a middle boarding school. So all the children from Tolong, from Kumbungu, from Nantong, from Savulgu, from Pongtamale, they all had to come to Kalpohan Middle Board. Even before Ganao School and Tamal School, all of these schools? Yeah, absolutely. So, and then it was called Eastern Dagbong District, uh, Eastern Dagbong uh, Primary School, so, so to speak. But in our year, they decided to build a middle boarding school in Savulgu. So the school between Savulgu and Pongtamale, which is now the deaf and dumb yeah, school, okay. we were the pioneers. Okay. So we went to prim uh, middle school in Savulgu. But at the time we, were, we went, in 1960, the contractor had not done the, the, bo the, the, the boys' uh, dormitory. Yeah. So they moved us to Savulgu town, got a classroom for us in the primary school, which was Form 1, and then we were day students in Savulgu. It was the following year in 1961, that we went into the boarding school proper at Banyala. We called it Banyala, that's uh, uh, the, the Savrugo Middle Boarding School. Then in 1962, uh, we were the pioneers. We did the common entrance, and I passed alongside other colleagues of mine to go to Tamal School, Tamal Secondary School. So I went to Tamale Secondary School in September 1962, uh, where I stayed and did my O-level in 1967, and then continued to do the SIF form, that was the A-level, in 1969. So, 
Before we move on, at A level, did you already have a dream career that you wanted to pursue? Indeed, I had. You know, before at the end, at the level of all, at all level, I wanted to be a police investigator. In fact, I wanted to be an investigator because I had read uh, Conan Doyle's uh, books and I was intrigued by the work of an investigator. Okay. Then later on, I wanted to be a news reader. Uh, because I admired certain news readers, Robert Hammond, Robert Owusu, you know, I just loved the way they, you know, read news. So I wanted to be a news reader. But eventually, when I got to Suform, I went to visit my uncle in Sunyani, you know, during holidays. And I went to the court and I saw a lawyer in Sunyani. He was called Dr. I.L. Ohinejan. He was a very flamboyant you know, kind of lawyer, and he just took my fancy. And I said, no, 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 I want to be a lawyer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that stayed. <laughs> Interesting times, I think it was. But then, have you had any Arabic education aside? Well, yes, I had a little of it. I had a taste of it. I told you when I went to middle school, okay. they hadn't completed the middle boarding school, the dormitory. So we're living in Savulugu town while attending classes in the Savulugu uh, primary school there. And the house that I lived with, my, with my elder sister, Hajifishata of uh, blessed memory, was Alajifushen Dahala Yina, which was a Karanzong. They were, uh, you know, he was a, a malam, a very uh, reputed malam, and therefore he was teaching. And therefore I joined them, and I picked up quite a lot within the one year that I was left, we lived with them. Yes, so for my prayers and other things, I have no problem. But then how were you able to manage, you know, I'm sure growing up as a child, you would have been sent to farm, you know, Arabic education, there's, you know, how were you able to put all these things together growing up? I've always been a homeboy. I've always loved the life at home. I've always wanted to be with my people, even as a child growing up in the, in, in, as a student in the university, even when I became minister, even today. A lot of times I don't sleep in this house, I sleep in Kumbungo. Yeah, that, that in <laughs> fact, it, it, it's, it's intriguing, it, it surprises me a lot. Yes. Because like, uh, it's, it's, you, you live more in Kumbungo today than even... That is true, because I, 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 I believe in living with my people. They inspire me, and I also inspire them. Yeah. And then we, we, we solve our problems together. You know, it's when I get to Kumbungu that I feel real. Because in, everywhere people are saluting you, people are going down. I get to Kumbungu and I see people that I have to go down and bow, bow down and greet because they are, I know they are my seniors, they are my aunties, they are my uncles, you know. So I, I, I feel inspired by that. So let's come back to the education. We stopped at A-level where you went to Tamasco and then from there. Yes, from Tamasco, I, I went to law school, that is the University of Ghana, Faculty of Law. I did my first degree and graduated in 1972, okay. and I proceeded to do my master's uh, program, and uh, I, I, I got my master's degree in 1975, and thereafter, I went on to do my professional training as a lawyer, uh, you know, that was... Uh, then I was called to the Ghana Bar in October 1975. That was when I was called uh, to the bar as a lawyer. Are you an armchair lawyer or you have had <laughs> cases in court before? No, certainly not. I have always wanted to be very active as a lawyer. So my early life, some of the jobs that I took, I found that they were not challenging. They were not really testing my, my law. They were, I was not actually living the life of a lawyer. For instance, I, I took a job with the Bank for Housing and Construction as a legal officer and uh, I found it extremely boring. It was, it was very rewarding. They bought me a car, they gave me accommodation, they were giving me fuel coupons and you know, life was nice and easy but I didn't get the feel. I didn't get the feel. I wasn't going to court the way I wanted. So I quit in less than one year. I quit and I decided to go to the judiciary which was the other extreme. So I was appointed a district magistrate and uh, stationed in Aguna Suedru. Uh, Aguna Suedru later on transferred to Tema, uh, Tema District Court. Uh, that was... And in, in, the, in the experience of uh, your district magistrate life, 
I think you did about three years or so Absolutely, as a district yeah. magistrate. That's right. Now, uh, how was the job about? Like, what was it about? Was, is it like you were, were a judge? Yeah, yeah, it's the job of a judge. And uh, the, the really interesting thing was that Aguna Suedru is close to uh, Cape Coast, is close to Accra, is close to Sekendi Takradi. So you had lawyers, eminent lawyers, coming to appear in my court. And I had opportunity to learn from a lot of them. Wow, this is this is interesting. Like I, I feel so excited deep inside me. You were like, I, I feel like I should have been on your seat as a judge to see how it is. You know, did you receive death threats? You know, not really, not really. There were some challenges, but I never got a death threat. I was a very young man then. I was just about 26 years old. So, what what few challenges as a judge would you want to share with us? Uh, yes, you know, people come to the court with their problems, with their disputes, and they are expecting a fair, speedy yeah. resolution of the dispute, you know. And therefore, at the level of the magistracy, the district magistracy, the processes were not complicated. They were quite simple. Uh, the trials were summary trials. Therefore, they were faster, speedier, and therefore it met the expectations of the, of the, of the, of the litigants, of the people. So that aspect was really, really good. So now let's come back to talking about uh, Yelenzo Chambers. Yeah. Yelenzo is a Dagbani word that I know. Yeah. Tell my friend. Uh, tell my friends, yeah. Okay. Now, Yelenzo Chambers, what is your relationship with Yelenzo Chambers? Yes. See, when I, well, I, I, had, I had some problems as a magistrate with transfers, you know, I had been transferred once. And, uh, you know, I was doing other things besides just being a magistrate. And the transfer cost me quite a bit. So I realized that my future did not lie in the public service. I was yearning for real action. So I decided to go into law practice. But I'm sure if you had stayed by now, who knows, you would have been the, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, what do we call well, it, the Chief Justice. Possible. Yes, possible yes. Because my mates, my mates are even retiring from the Supreme Court now. Justice Akamba. I was appointed magistrate at the same time with him. He had just retired from the Supreme Court. Justice Atukuba was my law classmate. Uh, the present Chief Justice. So do, do you still have you know, contact with these people? Do absolutely, you absolutely. The present Chief Justice, Sophia Akufo, was my direct cl law classmate. Uh, Vaida Akoto Bampo, Bampo, who is still in the Court of Appeal, is also a, a law classmate. Uh, we have Justice Latte, who retired from the Supreme Court a few years back, uh, he too was uh, a direct law classmate. <laughs> so now let's come back to talking about Yelenzo Chambers, yeah. you know. Uh, what, 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 what went into the setup? Uh, was it your, your sole, you know, chamber? Yes, indeed. When I decided to quit from the judiciary, in that was in 1980, I decided that I was coming back home. And when I come home, I was going to set up a practice in law and then when I came, uh, the late Mr. Momune Baumia, of blessed memory, uh, he Baumia's, was like a father to me. Dr. Baumia's father. Exactly. <laughs> he was just quitting. He was just leaving practice. He was in law practice. He was just leaving to join. I mean, uh, the Limam administration had appointed him the chief executive for Cocoa Board. So he was winding up to leave. When I arrived and I went and greeted him, he said, well, come, come. So I kind of took over his office, took over his desk, the furniture, the, the files, and he even gave me his gown and, and his wig. Everything. No, no, no. He, he really was a father to me. And therefore, I took, I took over. And then, you know, because of uh, my work as a district magistrate, as I told you, a lot of very eminent lawyers appeared before me and I learned a lot from a whole lot of them. I did not really need to go into chambers with a senior. Yeah. So I went on my own and then when I decided to do that, I looked for a name and I said, okay, I will call it Yelenzo. Okay. In Dagbani, there's this song. Yelenzo ye, Yelenzo ye, nimbe wani, kutuma sang mana kwabga, kanti whatever. So I said, look, tell it to my friends. Tell it to my admirers, tell it to my colleagues that I'm also now in the, in the dance. They should send me bowls of food for, to give to the dancers. In other words, solidarity. On this, on this Yelenzo note, you know, I, 
We are going to go for a very quick commercial break. It's, it's, it's exciting. I just can't wait for us to come back from this break. Stick and stay. We are back shortly. Welcome back from the commercial break. My name is Abdul Jalil Nabiel and I am the son of Musa Kumo. My guest today is Alaji Honorable, lawyer, Mohamed Mumuni, former foreign affairs minister, former several things. And before we went for the commercial break, we were actually talking about Yelenzo Chambers, which he founded. So Alaji, let's talk, let's continue from where we, we stopped. Yes, you know, uh, the name was prophetic because as soon as I started, I had a number of very committed Clients. Very efficient gentlemen okay. come to join me. Okay. Okay. Lawyer B.B. Saibo, who is still in practice, okay. came to, to, to join me. Okay. Mohamed Alassan, uh, otherwise called Lawyer Terror, okay. he came to join me. Uh, Alima, Ter was he the former D.C. for Yendi? For Yendi. Yeah. Because from my chambers, he went to become D.C. for Yendi. Yeah. Then he came back. Okay. You know, S.Y. Saini, uh, Papa called Lawyer S.Y., he came to join me. Alima Mahama, who is now Minister for Local Government, she came to join me. Uh, one Justice Imoru from Gushago, he also came to join us. Subsequently, he became a High Court judge. I believe he has just uh, retired. So we assembled all of these uh, people and uh, we, 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 we did quite a lot of business. I'm happy that today Yellowzo Law Chambers is still active. It is alive and I pay tribute to my colleagues who kept it alive even when I left and went into politics. Uh, Mohamed Alassan especially has been a, a real pillar. And uh, I'm also proud to say that my own son, uh, Rashid Mumuni, has also qualified as a lawyer and he has come to join Yellenzo Law Chambers. Uh, I, I, I consider that... What more is, would somebody need from a, a life, you know? But then, talking about all these great people coming to join you, you know, what worked for you as a, as, as a chamber? What worked for you? Hard work, commitment, integrity. People bring their case to you and they want you because they are in distress. They come to you because they are anxious. Something is happening. Their rights are being violated or about to be violated and they want you to address those issues. So they expect honesty from you, they expect integrity, they expect hard work, they, they expect commitment. And we're, we're doing exactly that. Before we come to your days at NSS, you said earlier that uh, you were appointed a district magistrate at a tender age, not tender, but in that particular profession, I think it's a tender age of 26. Yeah. I think it's one of the earliest, you know, in, 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 in the judiciary. You know, what worked for you? What, like, what did they see in you that made them appoint you to be a district magistrate? Well, actually, in those days, uh, the, the lawyers were not very many. And the judiciary especially uh, was trying to attract people, lawyers, to come in to be magistrates. So it was not difficult to get in there, you know. But then, let's stay a little more on the district magistrate role. Um, not too long ago, Anas came up with an expose on judges and corrupt ones amongst them. You know, how different were you from some of these exposés that we saw? Yeah, well, you know, after the perception of corruption in the judiciary, it has always been there. You know, two people have a dispute, they come to you. Uh, I haven't met any candidate who has failed an exam, who hasn't blamed yeah. the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, 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 so, watched, I watched the movie and they say, them give me. When, when, you, when you fail, you say, them give me. That's right. But if you pass, you say, uh -huh. I made it. I made it. Mm. Exactly. So two people bring their dispute to you. You settle the dispute at the, at the end of the day. The successful candidate is very happy. The one who loses will go and say, ah, the magistrate took bribe. Yeah. You know, that's why I lost my case. Mm. You know, so there's always that perception. You know, but of course, there are bad nuts also. There are people who will sell their own reputation, 
you know, just for a mess of potash. You know, so therefore there have been bad magistrates, there have been bad judges. What Anas did really was to expose some of these people. Yes. As you know, some, some people that he tried to lure, yeah, they, they resisted, they you know, but quite a number of them fell for, fell for it. But have you, in your own work experience as a district magistrate, encountered people trying to bribe you? Oh, yes, certainly. I mean, a lot, a whole lot. Uh, they use all kinds of methods. They go to your relations, they go to your friends, they come with money, they come with... Sometimes they just... So usually, what, would you, what did you do to kind of... Or did you take them? <laughs> no, no, I did not. I certainly did not. <laughs> yeah, I'll sure. tell you a very interesting story. Mm. You know, I was, uh, of course, I'm a magistrate in Aguna I was sitting in court in Ejumaku on Mondays, and I was sitting in court in Winneba on Wednesdays. On a Sunday, I was at home, when a group of uh, six people came in their clubs and they were looking very concerned, they were looking very worried, and I, 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 I greeted them, and then they said, oh, we want your father. You know, like I said, I was very young, therefore. They thought my father, the magistrate must be a bald-headed man. <laughs> so they said they wanted my father. So my father is going to Accra. Then they sat down for some, and then told me, hmm, they have a matter uh, in court in Ejumaku tomorrow, and they, they decided that they would come and see him. But now that he's not there, this is what they brought. It was an envelope. I should take. I said no. My father told me never to take anything uh, for for him, so I cannot. So they, they, they. Then when they were leaving, they brought out some little money. Uh, the the magistrate son, I should what collect one? that one too. I I refused. <laughs> now it turned out that that particular case, their relative had was a hunter. He'd gone to the bush, and then he saw an animal and shot at it. It turned out to be a human being. Whoa. So they arrested him, and he was under a murder charge. Yes. And he was to be brought to my court that following day, the Monday, for committal. So the following day, I, I was in court, and I could spot them sitting there, and they were very uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> because they now realize their mistake. Ah, this is the young man we met. You know, so I thought, that job is a high risk job, no doubt about that. Very tempting. People will want to bribe you, people will want to, uh, uh, you know, compromise you in different, different ways. Sometimes they will even send women, they know you have a proclivity towards uh, the fairer sex. They will send pretty women after you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now, now let's talk a little about. Uh your work experience as a national service coordinator now you were nss coordinator for about a year or so how was it like that was my national service okay. you know national service was introduced in 1973 okay. you know and then if i had gone after my first degree 72 i wouldn't have been caught by it but because i went back for the masters yeah. and then the professional training i had to do national service okay. then they picked up on me to be the Northern Regional Coordinator of National Service. So I had to come with a batch of service people here and then do the placements and then do the follow-up to find how they settled and then reported on them uh, how they performed. So you were doing this as a national service? That was my national service. And I was attached to the regional organization. And you, 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 you ended up being very successful in this? Well, yes, I, I was, I was. But I must also say that after the service personnel had settled in their various placements and everything, I practically had nothing else to do. <laughs> and then I joined Ibrahim Mohammed's chambers, Malugu chambers. I went to him and he took me in as a young lawyer and then he assigned me various duties. So I was quite active going to court. Now those were the days when Tamale was very active and there was a lot of business in the mid 70s. Rice was booming. We had the rice city. People had tractors. People had all kinds of, kinds of vehicles, and therefore, you know, life was quite busy. And therefore, I found myself going to court practically every day, you know, doing cases. So, I part of my uh, ed education in law practice was uh, achieved. So, from there, you went to become the local government. Uh, you know, Grants Commission Chairman or so. Yeah, no, no, member. Member. Yeah. Now, what, what is Local Government Grants Commission? Yes, it's part of the local government system at that time. You know, uh, the whole of Dagbong 
had only two district councils, yeah. Eastern Dagomba and then Western Dagomba. Western Dagomba in Tamale, Eastern Dagomba in Yendi. And I was uh, elected chairman of the Western Dagomba District Council. Okay. Okay. You know, so as chairman of the Western Dagomba District Council, under the 1979 constitution, there was the Local Government Grants Commission, which was national. And they had the, 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 the work of uh, allocating resources yeah, to the district councils, council. you know, so that's exactly what. So I, I represented the northern region okay. on that body. That's okay. right. All right. So let, now let's talk about the Western Dagomba, you know, district, which we just talked about. You were the chairman. Is it, was it like, um, just like we have district assemblies or municipal assemblies, it, was it the same? Or? Yes. Yeah, we had uh, district councils. And then they were members of the council. Uh, they were mainly nominated and appointed. Okay. And then they also comprised a certain percentage of the chiefs okay. in the area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then they will sit down together and elect their chairman. So I was elected chairman of Western Dagomba District Council. At that time I was about age 30. You know, and uh, so I had the opportunity to steer the affairs of the district council, you know, uh, with the district administrative officer, uh, you know, yeah. that was before, uh, of course, before the revolution, 1981, before the decentralization process, uh, which I also took part in, you know, because uh, under the PNDC's dis decentralization program, when we had the various district assemblies that were created. Uh, the Tolong Kumbungu District Assembly was one of them. Uh, Western Dagoba had been partitioned into several dis districts. And then uh, the process of election also came up because grassroots democracy. So I went and filed my nomination in Kumbungu at Yagrafon. And it was the news of the, it was news in the country that a, a prominent lawyer in Tamale is going to stand for district level elections as assembly member. We'll come to that, but before then, you know, reading through your profile, I came across bonds at the Rural Bank. And once again, from all walks of life, you steered around and you came to financial issues. What is your association with bonds at Rural Bank Limited? Yeah, you see, you know, some of us, I will say we're lucky in one breath, and also we were overworked in the other. Because we're the early educated people, you practically had to be everything. You had to do everything. And therefore, you know, uh, especially if you are attached to your home and you are attached to your community, and then you see the issues, you see the problems, and then you think that you can have help solve them, you know, then you, 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 you task yourself. That's how Bonza Rural Bank came about. A number of us, in fact, three of us, the president, one are Yusuf, okay. and then one Mr. He's now the, the Naim of Kumbungu, okay. uh, Sumani, in my hall here. We said, look, everywhere they are establishing district, uh, I mean, uh, uh, rural banks. Yeah. It's a self-help type of situation, community-based. Yeah. Why don't we do one? There was not, there was none in northern region, yeah. so we decided that we will start it. So we started it, and the beginning was very rough. Luckily, we had a young man come from Accra uh, who happened to have some relations with uh, some directors in the Bank of Ghana. So he collaborated with us, one Alaji Baba Isa. He's now the chief of Wangara in, uh, in Accra. Okay. So together, we, we, we pushed and pushed until finally, I think it was about 30th August 1990, the bank was inaugurated, and it was a huge affair. The Yana, Yana, Yakub and Daniel of blessed memory, he came there. Uh, John Bauer uh, of blessed memory, he was the regional, the PNDC regional secretary. Yeah. Dr. G.K. Agama uh, was the governor of the Bank of Ghana. Uh, Kumbungu was set alight al with all of these personalities there, and we inaugurated Bonsdale Rural Bank. Initially, it was Kumbungu Rural Bank. And I went to register it at the Registrar General's in Accra. But when we decided to send it 
to Yendi, to Gushagu, to other places. Other places. We said no. If we go, Kumbungu is there. They will, they will, they will, they will say ah, it's for Kumbungu yeah, people. They stigmatize it. So we had to change the name. And I proposed the name Bonzale. Okay. Because the full name is Bonzale Kudivi. Yeah. I Bonzale Kudivi. You know, a young man from one of the villages in Kumbungu, Chanjao, came to Kumbungu and under a, a tree, he was repairing bicycles. And he said, Mangulum Bono Bonzal Kudivi. You know. And then that area, which is now called the station in Kumbungu, yeah. became Bonzal Tesa. Okay. Bonzal Tesa. Okay. And that was exactly the spot where our bank was. So I said, why don't we adopt the name Bonzal? After all, even for a bank, it is very fitting. I Bonzanzale. You know, against a rainy day. I could divi. Yeah. <laughs> Let's now come to you being an electoral area member so to say like assembly member you know these were times that you had already you know achieved a lot what inspired you to contest for assembly member of your electoral area uh, it's, it's very interesting some of us took positions against the pndc purely because it was a military regime and we didn't i didn't, I didn't like military regimes so i was really an opponent of the pndc really yes i was so you will even call us opposition. So the WDCs, the PDCs, all of those things, some of us, they didn't bring it near us. Yeah. So when the government came up with the decentralization program and then decided that they will open the floodgates for grassroots democracy, I said, okay, I'll go to my people. I'll go and see what is, there is in it. This is what sent me. So I was elected. Uh, in my electoral area, I was unopposed. Wow. Then they said, no, no, under the PNDC law, there's, not, there's no, nothing like unopposed. There must be a referendum. So yes and no. Yeah. So they went to yes and no, and only one person voted no. They said, oh, they are going to the to find out who put that no. <laughs> anyway, so I was elected. And I went to Tolong Kumbungu. It was a new district assembly, yeah. uh, Tolong Kumbungu district assembly. I was elected the presiding uh, member for two exec uh, consecutive terms. Yeah. And then, of course, while there, the, the PNDC decided to formulate the constitution for Ghana, and therefore they set up the national, I mean, the consultative assembly. Okay. You know, and the district assembly had to send somebody to represent them. Naturally, as a lawyer, they decided that, no, I should be the one to represent them. So I went to represent the Tolong Kumbungu District Assembly in the Consultative Assembly uh, to formulate Ghana's uh, constitution. So is that how you got into politics? Well, yes, it was a step-by-step -step thing. I started with local government, as I told you, chairman of the Western Dagumba District mm -hmm. Council, then later on assembly member, now presiding member, now member of the uh, Consultative Assembly. That was the platform. That was where the, the people of this country started taking note and said, ah, but who is this young man? <laughs> you know, because some of us were among the movers and the shakers in the, in the consultative assembly. So, how then did you get proper into politics? Like, when did you start serious politics? Yes, I will say it is in the consultative assembly. It was while the, the consultative assembly was going that the political parties were being formed. The NDC, the MPP, the PN, uh, whatever, P -P -P they were being formed yes, at that time. NIP. Exactly. But me, I've always been an Nkrumahist. Okay. I believe in Kwame Nkrumah's ideals. You know, and therefore I'm an incremist. And therefore, at the very beginning, they tried to get me into the NDC. I resisted it because I said, no, I have my elders back home. I cannot come to Accra and pick a party and go home. I have to go home and listen to my people. When I came home and listened to my people, the likes of lawyer Ibrahim Mahama, others, they said, no, we are CBP people. We are not going to go with any other party. So. I, I, I became the parliamentary candidate for the Heritage Party in Kumbungu. So alongside the opposition NPP, we boycotted the, 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 the parliamentary elections after the presidential elections. Yes. So I remained in the opposition and I became the chairman of the 
uh, co co convention uh, people's uh, party. At that time, it was not convention people's party. They they actually refused that we should not use the name convention, convention people's party. party. Yes, it was people's convention party. Exactly. PCP. So I was the regional chairman. Then, in course of time, in course of time, I was enticed, and I believe I was motivated to join the NDC. So who pushed you? A lot of my friends talked to me and said, "Look, why?" You, you are good material. Why? You are wasting your time elsewhere. Why don't you come in? I, I resisted it. So, but who then would you consider your political godfather? Do you have any? I will say Jerry John Rollins. Wow. I will say so. I will say Jerry John Rollins because finally he came to Tamale and then sent for me at the mile nine, the barracks. You indeed were a hot kick. <laughs> so I went to him and he said, look, young man, what are you doing? Look, we need you. Can't you see we have a development agenda? We are concerned about development. You see, this is your chieftain thing, Abudu, and then we are not interested. We think that it is wrong to exploit the differences on the people. We should rather think of bringing them together. So we are creating a platform whereby we can bring in the Andanis and bring in the Abudus and they will work together to develop your land and not concern yourselves with this chieftain thing. Seriously, he said this. And, and he was, said, and the way we are speaking, I can see him <laughs> in you right now. Oh, yes, yes, certainly. So when he said that, he said, look, I should come to Accra and talk to Justice Annan. Hmm. So I went to Accra, and Justice Annan was sounding the same. And I said, well, OK. Already my people in Kumbungu, a lot of even the elites, they can say, I lawyer the Abu the party woman. I look who saw the, you know, because Ayajeje yeah. had yeah, caught on. Ayajeje yeah. had caught on, and a yeah. lot of my people were deserting. In fact, in '92, the presidential election, yeah. General Eskin got his highest vote hmm. nationwide in the Kumbu conference. Wow. Largely because of people like Lawyer Brian Mahama yeah, and, and myself and a few other people who are all in the, in, the, in, the, in the CPP, you know. So I joined the NDC. No wonder, as soon as I joined the NDC, they made me the parliamentary candidate for Kumbongo. Okay, so on this parliamentary candidate note, we are going to go for another quick commercial break. We will come back and talk more about how uh, lawyer became the Kumbugu MP and a lot more about politics and life generally. Don't go away, we are back shortly. Proximate people, thanks so much for hooking on and staying with us on My Northern Achiever. My name is Abdel Jalil Nabiale, and today my guest remains Alhaji lawyer Mohammed Mumuni here with me at his residence. And uh, before we went for the commercial break, we were talking about lawyers, you know, interest in politics and how he got into politics. Now, lawyer, let's talk about your role as an MP for Kumbungu, for instance. Uh, have you always, or had you always groomed yourself? to become the MP for Kumbungu? I would say certainly yes. Because even before I went into formal politics, like I told you, Bonza Rural Bank, yes. you know, Kumbungu electrification program, practically any developmental initiative in Kumbungu, either I initiated it or part of the initiation or played a leading role. And therefore, it became a matter of uh, uh, it's automa it, was, it was automatic that I would want to represent the voice of Kumbungu and then to echo their voice and then to, uh, to, 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 to strive to achieve their aspirations. So naturally, uh, that is how come when I even joined the NDC from the very first day, they said, no, you will be the MP. And therefore, the then MP gracefully decided to step down and allow me to stand. And then, I went to uh, Parliament, hardly had I gotten there, when President Rollins decided that no, he would make me a cabinet minister. So he invited me and made me the Minister for Employment and Social Welfare, cabinet rank. And then at the orientation, he told my colleagues, the new uh, appointees, that look, uh, in this country people talk about reconciliation, 
but I want to live reconciliation. I want to demonstrate reconciliation in practical terms. This young man, you all know him. I had a brush with him, and it's true. In Tamasco, at our 40th anniversary of uh, old Tamascans uh, of Tamasco, mm -hmm. I had a public row with President Rawlins. Really? I was the president of the Old Tamascans Association. And you weren't afraid. And I, well, people came to assure me. The, late, the likes of Alaji Hudu Yahya, Alaji Mama Idrisu, they came to my house to assure me that I shouldn't worry. <laughs> Nothing will happen to me, you know, because I had a public row with, yes. the, with the president, him, uh, with the chairman. He was then chairman of the PNDC. You were the, uh, and I was president of the Old Tamascans Association. And he. He, he, he took me on right there in the public and people were really afraid for me, you know. So he took opportunity to say that, look, because this incident was reported in the West Africa magazine, you know. Uh, so he said, look, we didn't agree with each other from the beginning, but today we are going to work together. He's going to be in my cabinet, you know. <laughs> I think Rollins is indeed a great man. You well, know. you know, certainly yeah. he did that. But then, I got something from what you said earlier. You have been groomed by some two great Northern personalities. Alaji Mumune Bamiya, for instance, and lawyer Ibrahim Mahama. How did you choose these people or did they choose you? Well, it's interesting. Uh, it looks like I just admired them because Look, when it comes to the interests of the North or the Northern people, Baumia would not compromise anything. Ibrahim Mahama would not compromise anything. And I admired that. I really admired that. And I got very close to them and I learned a lot from them. To stand I am for going, your people. I am going to start getting so close to you because <laughs> I think there's a lot I'm going to learn from you. Yes. And, um, so what advice from here, from what, from how you have been groomed by these people, what would you tell the younger ones today about what they believe in and who to groom them? Yeah, you see, when you are in politics, you must be in it for the interests and the welfare of your people. Now, these two gentlemen, anything that had to do with the development of the North, they wouldn't compromise one bit. For instance, the Northern University, UDS, yeah. it, 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 it just didn't spring up. Yeah. But Umiya started, started talking about a Northern University way back when he was local government minister in the Kwame Nkrumah uh, regime. And he's presented a memoranda making an eloquent argument for a Northern University. And eventually we got it. And eventually we got it. So it was just about perseverance. Absolutely. Wow. In the same way, Ibrahim Mahama, as a member of the National Liberation Council, he was uh, one of the commissioners, you know, he pushed so many of our brothers and sisters into positions that they would otherwise have just forgotten them. No, nobody was remembering them. So let's talk a little, like quickly, about being MP for Kumbungu. There are so many people who are from Kumbungu who will say that you did nothing for them as an MP. And when you say nothing, I sometimes wonder. But then, can you outline some few things, maybe three or more, yeah. that you did for Kumbungu that is so significant to the lives of the people? Yeah. Well, you know, polit politics is a game of antagonism. It's a competi competitive thing. You are, you are in competition with somebody. And therefore, you don't really want to even admit the that person's, you know, no. I mean, some people deliberately want to forget it yeah. in a, in a, in a, in a so rush. That it can yield yes. to their benefit. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. But when it comes to Kumbungu really, today, today, if you ask any Kumbungu person who is honest to himself, he will tell you that there is no developmental program in Kumbungu that I have not been involved in either initiated it, promoted it, or pushed it. Or have a hand in it, at or least. Or have a hand in it. Practical everything. Kumbungu electrification. You know, when the whole thing started, they said self-help, self-help electrification. Again, in this, my hall, the, three, the two gentlemen I mentioned, Mona, 
uh, Yusuf Abdallah. Yeah, those that you started Bonzale with. Those that I started Bonzale with. Again, in my hall here, we said, look, hey, look, self electrification, Kumungu, we should also be thinking about it. What do we do? So we took money, we went to information services, we hired a, an information van to go around Tamale and say that. Then that was when I realized that Kumbu, Tamale is full of Kumungo people. Yeah. <laughs> the place was filled and we put the agenda on the table and we told them, look, this is what is happening. We want to do self ratification for Kumungo. They embraced the idea. The late lawyer Ara Alassan and other elders from Kumbu, they were all there. They embraced the idea, we set up a fund, and we made contributions. We sent delegations down south to where Kumbungu people were concentrated, to Tema, to Obuasi, to Kumasi. We got contributions. Our late chief, Kumbuna Sumane, you know, he embraced the idea. He levied every house. We put together the money. We went to Takradi. We bought poles, hired an articulated truck, and it brought the poles to, to Kumbungu. It was after that that government decided to come in and when government decided to adopt it it was the polls that we bought that were used initially and then everything for that's talking about electricity our road kumungu road was in a bad state the people of sabulugu they were warriors and, <laughs> <laughs> and i have i am with the people of sabulugu because know. my maternal grandmother exactly. Aj ajirai is from sabulugu, from sabulugu. And so i always would say i it. know yeah, sabulugu yeah. people who say oh you you have no road your road is this your road is that okay. you know uh john hamilton he was the head of tesek in tamale here when they were doing tamale roads yeah. one day he called me john hamilton called me to his office near everything there and told me hey i hear you are the, the mp for kumbungu you see our equipment they are all standing in the yard they are idle our program in tamale is almost finished this is your kumbungu uh, road if you can get your government to give it to us we are going to use weeks not months to tie it and we will even pre uh, pre-finance it i was shaking I went to Accra, I went to Alaji Hudu Yahya, we went to Professor Mills, who was the vice president. The whole idea was taken. Straight away, uh, E.K. Salia, who was the minister for roads, was called. He said, look, the Kumbungu road must be done. You know, then we started. Later on, Salia said, oh, World Bank program says there should be no sing single sourcing, that we have to do tender. Meanwhile, they said had even brought their estimates. So when they said that, they said got angry and said they won't tender. Why did we deceive them and took their estimates? They had exposed themselves to us. So they didn't tender. Well, we went to tender and Ghanem won it. Yeah. I went to Ghanem and said, oh, please. They said, oh, the award letter. So I went to Highways, brought the award letter to them. They said they wanted some uh, mobilization. I said, oh, please. We were then jeering for election 2000. I went to Kumbungu and brought Alaji, the late Alaji uh, Zakari Mewia. Okay. And when we brought some simple boys from Dalong to Philom Point here, he made prayers, they dug the ground, and they cut the sword, and the, 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 the tire of the Kumbungu road started. These clearly are two significant things that anybody who cares to listen and to hear would, you know, praise lawyer for because electricity is a key thing and road is something so significant i think these two i am okay with it <laughs> and unfortunately time is of the essence <laughs> um you and i would agree that this cannot be the end of this we need to get back to lawyer and take some more from him i know and i believe that you have already learned a lot but it cannot be enough so we are not taking lawyers final words for today because next week we will come back with another way again. My name is Abdul Jalil Naberi. I am the son of Musa Kino. See you again next week. Bye-bye.